minutes from you. Just your undivided attention. Just, uh, I'm sure most of you know, but we're going to, I'm going to make it, just share with you that don't know, but most of you do because I've told close, I've told people to, I just can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but my wife is pregnant. <laughs> So, yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I'm thankful because the Lord spoke to me, and I'm thankful for my child, and it's a reward. It's a blessing. But when your youngest child's eight years old, and, and we're at an age where we were not expecting that, <laughs> didn't expect that at all. That's a miracle child. The doctor told my wife because of, her can because of the cancer that she had, she can never have children. So we thought, yeah, we thought that that season was over. Until my wife came in one day and says, I got something to tell you. I'm like, what's that? I'm pregnant. Like, yeah, okay. So you better go get another test. What did that say? I'm pregnant. Yeah, I don't mind. Hallelujah. I sat out and looked in front of my window for probably, I don't know, two or three hours prophesying. Jesus, thank you, Lord. But you know what? I'm thankful. I'm thankful. She's 12 weeks pregnant is what you said, right? 12 weeks pregnant. God is good. Do you know it actually says in the Bible that God rewards you with children? So it's a blessing from the Lord. It's a blessing from the Lord. I'm going to share my story. If you can stretch out your hands towards me. Say, Jesus, don't allow Derek to say anything in the flesh. Everything spirit-led, spirit-empowered, in Jesus' name. You know, one thing that is a pet peeve. Of, how did pet peeve? Peeve. Where's my little girl at, man? She, my little girl gives me such a uh, uh, complex now with that. And she picked on me every day. Um, is when people test the lie. I don't like test the lying. Testify. Don't test the lie. So I'm going to give you my testimony. And there's people that can confirm it. I'm in my hometown. Amen? I was born and raised in Wildwood. I grew up on Hall Street right across from the Baptist Church in a, in a house that was run down. We all got our story. I'm just going to tell you mine. This is a true story. We took a shower outside. There was a garage that had an outside shower. I took a shower outside. We didn't have shower in our house. The floor had rotted in the bathroom. And we used the bathroom in a hole in the floor. It was so bad that HRS came through one day with masks on. And me and my siblings, we ran around like it was no problem because we were raised in that. Ringworms and lice. That was my life. Cockroaches. Filthy. I can't eat certain things today because of that. My Uncle Jimmy's here. He tried to adopt me. They wouldn't let him. It was messed up. My dad smoked crack. He had robbed everything we had. He got hooked on crack cocaine. And we smoked crack. A lot of things come with that. He would get high and paranoid. I remember one time he took us to the playground at the Wildwood Immediate School. He was smoking hard, smoking crack, got paranoid. Thought I called the police on him. He held me hostage. And when he didn't have crack cocaine, he beat the brakes off me. Douglas knows he's here. Beat me. Man, just beat me half to death. I don't know what his deal was. Pulled guns on me. Just beat me. Until about 15, he couldn't beat me no more. But I grew up in that environment. My mama worked at WeCare from 3 to 11. She, 
She had her issues. Um, she got hooked on pain pills. But she worked free to 11 to try to make ends meet. And we lived in a rundown shack. My granddaddy did what he could do, but when he died, everything went, went south. He had got sick. And at 15 years old, I'll never forget it. We were hungry, and there was a guy in Wildwood. He's dead now, so I'll mention his name. They called him Swift. Y'all may know him. Winfrey Mitchell. And I watched them in the commons selling dope. And I used to pick watermelons from Uncle Jimmy, man. And we worked morning till dark picking watermelons. I would take the money from the watermelon fields that I worked for my Uncle Jimmy. And I saved it one year. My dad stole it from me, man. Went and bought crack. And worked all summer. I'm like, man, stole all my money. I'll be honest, Uncle, I appreciate you letting me pick watermelons, but I didn't want to pick them anymore. I wanted to. But I'm glad I did. I wish I could find a watermelon field. I put my two boys in it. Yes, sir. Because I'm telling you what, that made a man out of all of us. That's what's wrong with Wildwood today. We ain't got no more watermelon fields. That's why our football team ain't winning anymore because we ain't got no more watermelon fields. And uh, at 15 years old, I went to him. I said, man, I, wanna, I need to make some money. And I'll never forget what he said to me. Because my, they, I used to ride my bicycle with no shoes on. Those spike pads, no shoes on, dirty feet. And I'd be all through Wildwood, and, and they gave me a nickname, Dirty White Boy, because I was dirty. And then they, they took the white boy off and just called me dirty for the rest of my life. I lived up to that name, I can promise you that. And uh, I started selling dope when I was 15. I got a bunch of nickel sacks. They gave me, they slapped my head, gave it to me for $5, I was selling it for $10. Well, anyway, my first, my first day on the job, it made me $75. I went to Angelotti's, I got some pizza and a two liter soda, and, and we sat on that old raggedy front porch of my house, and we ate that whole pizza. And I'm like, man, I think I got me a new idea here. I, this is something that's going to work. And I graduated from marijuana to cocaine. I got an eight ball of cocaine, bagged it up into dime bags. And I'll never forget it. And I stood in front of the commons and sold out of dime bags, and I got robbed. Beat up. Took my money. I ain't going to say who did it. So at that time, Gangster Disciples was coming through Sumter County in Central Florida. It was a high-ranking gang from Chicago, GD, Hoover Folk. Some of y'all understand where I'm coming from that were part of that. And uh, I joined the gang. People think, wow, what, what kind of gang it is? You'd be surprised what goes on around here. Trust me. And the only really thing they did for me is when I got locked up, I got some honey buns and some boxers. But, but I joined the gang, moved up, became, a, became an IGD, low foot, high foot, just moved through all that mess. Became a confirmed gang member in um, the state of Florida. And then came time for me to pay dues. I had to pay them to be a gang member, and I didn't think that was a good idea. I'm not going to pay you any money. And that, anyway, I got kicked out of my own gang. So... That's pretty bad. Uh, but I, I used it to my advantage. When I needed it, I used it. But when I didn't need it, I was about Derek West. I was about dirty. The only thing I cared about was more, more money. Um, I caught my first charge at 18. I did my first, well, well, through juvenile, but 18, I did my first charge. Um, and then I was able to not catch a felony for probably five or six years selling dope because I, even though I had made a dumb decision, I was actually pretty smart with letting other people do it for me. Because I knew the less that I touched the product, the, the less chances I'd have to get locked up. And what I would do is, I would hide my car and I would walk around and, and did everything that I could do to make sure that the law enforcement didn't think I was selling dope. It worked for a while where I got my friends are all day hanging by the cars with big rims and gold chains and the police riding by acting like, why, why, are they on, why am I under investigation? Well, why do you think, brother? Of course, you know, uh, Rick Costanza's not here, my pro officer, and, and uh, Tom Ford's a lieutenant now, but he, when he was, when I was out there, he was, you know, he, his job was to nab me in Mona Park, and it's funny that he's part of my church now. So, 
That's what I did, man. I sold drugs my whole life. Um, just ruthless person. I, I, for seven years, I was a stick-up kid for gang. What I did was not only did I sell drugs, but I, I followed drug dealers around in other towns, and I would rob drug dealers. It's a perfect, perfect way to make a bunch of money because they're, they're going to call the cops. I stole their dope. But I would follow them, and I would follow them where they put their stash, and then I would have someone call and say, I need a couple thousand dollars worth, and then I would follow where they went to get it, and then, lo and behold, we came in 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, we robbed them. I did that, made a bunch of money doing it, spent a bunch of money. That's what I did, and I had a team, and I'm going to mention a team. We don't need to do that. And then, about... I never really got high off my own supply until I was about 24. You know that rule, don't get high off your own supply? Well, that's a lie. You always get high off your own supply. I, I, I made it last a while, though. Methamphetamine came into town, and I had a girl tell me, try this. I'm like, what is it? Eat it. Like, I ate it. I'm like, wow. First thing you know, I'm getting high. But that was, my, that was my life. That's what I did in this area. Now I'm passing in the area. I sold drugs. I robbed drug dealers, and I should have been killed, but God kept me alive. I don't need to go into detail how many times that I, I was shot at or how many times that they tried to kidnap me. Listen, I, I've robbed some boys I regretted. <laughs> I've come across some guys that's from another, from another country that I robbed, and those guys, act, I'm going to just say it, Joey, I, I robbed some Mexicans, man. Let me tell you, those Mexicans won't want to kill me. I robbed the wrong ones one time, down in Wild Mama. They actually came into Wild where I thought I was safe looking for me. I'll never forget, I was in the comments and the one guy said, you know a white boy they call dirty? I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> Across the parking lot, a guy screamed, dirty! <laughs> Shoo! <laughs> I should have been killed. But God saved me. You know, I wasn't really raised in the church, but my grandma took me to church one time and the prophet called me from the back row and said, bring your son up forward. And they didn't know what he said. And he, Grandma said, bring your grandson. I was probably 10 years old. And the prophet said, son, with your mouth, you're going to move mountains. I'm like, whatever that meant. So about, I was about 20, 26 in that life. Well, no, 20, no, my dad died. So my dad died. He smoked dope. But he had a brain aneurysm, and he died. And I couldn't stand my father. But I remember my sister called me and said, you know, your dad ain't going to make it. And I remember I went to the house just to see because my mama was crying. And my dad came in a wheelchair. I'll never forget it. And he tried to talk to me. I mean, I'll never forget this, man. I stood on the street. He says, hey, son, I want, can I talk to you for a minute? And I couldn't stand him, man. I'm like, what? He said, look, I'm sorry. Drugs, I, I, I said, man, I got messed up on crack cocaine and I've done some terrible things to you, and I can't take it back. I just want you to know I'm sorry for that. And my response to him was, you're just faking to get more pain pills. Get away from me. Well, that night he died. My like, man, my dad died. I mean, it was bad, but there were some good times. with my daddy, man. I don't care how bad they are, I see your blood. So he died, and I just kept selling dope, man. My mama called me two, two years later, I think, two or three years later, and said, I need to talk to you. I need you to come to the house. Now, my mama didn't let me out of the house. I remember one time, Doug, remember this, when I was playing cards on the hood of the car, and my, my mama didn't want me selling dope in her house, and she had saw me catch a, catch a sale in the front of her yard, and she come walking out. She said, who was that, son? I said, oh, that's nobody, mama. And she smacked me right in my mouth. My head hit the, embarrassed me, man. I had to. Smacked me so hard, I would, ne I would never bow up to my mama. I'm like, I couldn't believe she hit me like that. Sucker punched me, man. Wow, I told you not to do that in front of me. And I wanted to fight her so bad. I'm like, she had me so mad, a tear fell. And I said, why'd you hit me like that in front of my friends, mama? She said, why are you selling dope in front of your mama? I said, well, I just learned from y'all. She wasn't for that, man. I love my mama, man. Me and her have been through a lot together. I was her oldest son, and my dad beat her and
crack and all the things that she had to deal with. And she got hooked on pain pills because she got sick. But me and her went through a lot together. That was my mama, man. I see the way my boys are with their mama, and I know that's my mom. So my mama called me and said, I need you to come to the house. I said, okay, what's going on? And I, I thought she was going to set me up. I'm like, oh, she's going to call the police on me. So I made sure I was clean, everything, because, man, she would too, boy. I came to the house, and I went to the living room. I'll never forget it. I think my grandma was there. She said that she had been smoking cigarettes on a breathing machine for years. She sat in the living room and she said, uh, I got to tell you something. I'm like, what? I went to the doctors because I was hurting and the doctor says I have stage four cancer. And I'm ate up with it. She said he gives me 90 days or six, 90 days to six months to live. I'm like, what? My mom was like 43 years old, man. 44, I can't remember. She was young, younger than me. Like, ate up with cancer. Man, she died within two or three months. So I left there, man, and I just I started really getting high. And things started getting weird for me because I, I couldn't handle that life anymore. I had, a, I had a, a, a crack house in Moreland Park. I had one out there on 229 in Royal. I had a couple of different spots. I had one in Summerfield, one in Bellevue. I had five or six dope houses that I would just bounce back and forth, making sure that everything was there. Um, and uh, I, uh, when my mama told me that, I couldn't handle it anymore, man. Like something started happening to me. Like I... I really couldn't live that life anymore. I just couldn't take it. And uh, just try to drown it out. Well, I was at Moore Park one night. This is the, how my conversion came about. I was at Moore Park and I had fell asleep. Remember the starter jackets they used to have where you, where you pull them over? I'm going way back. You had the pockets there. And uh, it was probably about, I don't know, 12, 1 o'clock, and I had, and, and that was the chirp chirp phones back then. That's why, you know, back when there was beepers, it was hard to get cases, but when they went to the chirp chirp, everybody was getting locked up. So my phone ringed on my chest. I would put it on my chest so I could hear it vibrate, so if I fall asleep, I could wake up. It was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning is where most of your money comes. They just, everybody just like, I'm not going to get into that, but that's where, that's, that's when you make most of your money. And the lady got on the phone. And said, dirty? I'm like, yeah. She said, I want $40 worth of crack, hard. She said, $40, I need two 20s. And at that time, I started selling because I started getting high. I started to fall away. I started crumbling. I started selling back again 20s and $50 worth of dope. And I thought to myself, I was pride. I'm like, man, I can't believe I'm back nickel and diamond. Golly. And I told her, I said, you better have all the money, because if I come out of this house and you got $12 and you want, man, we're not, because if you, in the drug trade, they, they man, they, they all, kinds, all kinds of gimmicks. Tell me they got $500, get there, and they want to front it. And you don't traffic the dope to their house. Make you just want to go crazy. So I stood out in front of Mullen Park with a 380 pistol in my back pocket. It was nobody was out. It was late. It was cold. There was fog, there was a street light to the left. And I saw this figure come underneath the street light. And I said to myself, that must be the lady that called my phone. But as she was getting closer, I started getting like something was happening to me, like anxious, like, I don't know. It was weird, man. I'm looking around, I'm thinking, something don't feel right. She, I call her a she, I never saw her. I just heard her voice. It was a woman's voice. She said, dirty. I said to her as she's walking, I said, yeah, are you the one to call my phone? She said, yeah. I said, who are you? She said, dirty, you know me. Like I do? She said, yeah, I was, you were with rabbit. I bought dope off you. You were high on ice running with rabbit. Like, 
what the heck? Went running with a rabbit. I said, that's code for Sumter County to come get me. So I put the pill bottle, I had a big pill bottle full of 20s. I put the dope bag in my pill bottle, put it in my back pocket. I'm looking for my getaway. I'm like, you don't know me. She's walking. She said, Dirty, I saw you twice. I bought dope off you twice. You were high on ice, running with rabbit. I'm like, oh my God, she's telling him she's got two CI buys on me. Lord have mercy, I'm going to prison. She passed by me. She said, Dirty, I saw you three times. You were high on ice. Running with rabbit. I, I started crying. I'm like, who is rabbit? And where did you buy dope off me at? She got past me. She never looked at me. And then this is what triggered me. She called me by my real name. She said, Derek Daniel West. I went, oh, Lord. She said, I saw you four times. And I remember looking at her crying. I said, where did you buy dope, af dope off me? I was thinking, man, is in front of the church, a thousand feet from a church and a school? I'm like, where did you buy dope off at me then? And I'll never forget it. She said, I didn't. You were in church. She walked away. I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding. I'm like, in church? I ran into the house, and I woke everybody up. I said, you go find that lady now, and you bring her to me. So get up, go get her. My guys searched Molin Park high and low. We could never find her. I never saw her again. And they're like, one of the guys that was part of it is dead now, Dre. He's like, he's like, what happened? I was like, man, you ain't going to, that's code. So the next day, I go to my mama's house because I would put 20s in her Bible. She had her Bible next to her. I heard my mama praying in tongues. I never heard that before. I walk in the house and I hear her. So I run past the, the room. I'm like, what is she doing? She saw me. She said, Derek Daniel, is that you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, come here. I walked in. I said, what, mama? She said, uh, I had a dream last night. I'm like, what time was it? What, what time? Because here I go. Because I'm going through something. I just had somebody walk past me. I can't even find her. I'm like, it was the same time that lady walked past me. And she said, God told me, son, that I'm coming home. I'm like, what? What do you mean coming home? And I told her, I said, well, I don't believe in God. And my... How could God be real if he let us grow up the way we did? Now, I'll never forget what my mama looked at me. She had a tear in her eye. She looked different. She said, son, God spoke to me in a dream. I said, I said, oh, yeah? She said that the one I'm worried about the most is going to be okay. That's me always. I'm like, oh, yeah, mom? Yeah, what did he tell you? She looked at me, man. I'll never forget it. She said, son, God told me He's got you. You're going to preach the gospel. I said, preach the gospel? I said, do you know who I am? I don't preach the gospel. Mom, I'm a dope dealer. She said, no, I stand on it. You're going to be a preacher. I said, you're crazy, man. I, am not. I said, oxycons are cooking your brain from the cancer. There ain't no way I'm going to be a preacher. But I walked out of my house and I started having like a panic attack. And my truck was there. I said, I got to get out of here, man. And I didn't want to drive. I'm paranoid. So my neighbor, I went to him. I said, hey, man, can you, I need you to take me to 229. Drive for me. He said, oh, I can't do that. I said, yeah, you can. He said, absolutely, where you want to go. <laughs> you know how it is. So he drove me. And I remember seeing my little brother catching a lick at the end. He ran up to the road and he, he a, 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 lick, a dope sale. He did a hand to hand transaction, looked at me, gave me the thumbs up, like, man, look at me, bro. I'm getting the money. Ain't you proud of me? I'm like, man, I can't even. No, I'm not. I'm thinking to myself, what has my world come to? So I'm riding with this dude, man, to 229, and I look at him. I say, hey, man, do you believe in God? He's like, I guess so. I think there's something out there. 
hey, I don't know. He's like, why you ask me that, Dirty? I said, man, I don't know. I've been thinking about God lately. I said, thinking about God? I mean, yeah. I think God can heal my mama if he's real. And I was coming down, going to turn on 229. I'll never forget. And there was a church there that had a sign. It was New Life Christian Center Royal. And on the sign, it said New Life. So I said, hey, pull in that parking lot. He said, I ain't pulling the church parking lot. I said, pull in the parking lot. Pulled in the parking lot, and I ran to the, to the door. Well, I had a pistol. I put the, the pistol underneath the seat. And I'll never forget, I said, you better not run off with my gun. As a matter of fact, you're coming with me. <laughs> you're coming with me. So, oh, made him go with me. Because I didn't trust. Man, you know, it's that life, man. You don't trust nobody. I pound on the doors, and these kids see me, and they run and get, I thought they were bouncers. These guys came. They opened the door. I said, hey, how can we help you, sir? I said, uh, y'all believe in God? <laughs> they said, we do. I said, okay, well, I'm here for y'all to pray for my mama. She's dying, and we're poor. We don't got no insurance. My mama's going to die if something don't happen. I said, I can't lose my mama. And he said, what's your name? I said, Derek West. He went. He said, sit down. He came back. He said, Derek, you ready? I said, ready for what? He said, come here. And they pushed me in the sanctuary and Bishop Leslie Hanna, a tall pastor with dreads, cornrows. He's on the stage and the, and the guy said, Bishop, this is Derek West. I'm like, what are you doing that for? And the pastor said, Derek West, my God, I've been waiting on you, son. I'm like, what? You've been waiting on me? He said, come here. I said, man, listen, I'm, do you, can you pray for my mama? He said, we have been. Well, we've been praying for you. I said, man, you can't help me. I'll never forget it. I said, bro, listen, I got drug houses. I'm dirty. I'm not here for me, Pastor. I'm here for my mama. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, son, I said, I'm a drug dealer. I got a crack house two miles from the church. I got one in Moreland Park. He, I said, man, I sell dope. I always will sell dope. He said, son, you're a drug dealer. Those are the kind I like. I said, you can't help me. But I'll never forget, he looked at me and said, son, I can't help you. But I can tell you, I know somebody that can. I know somebody that can set the captives free. I know a Jesus that would take a dope dealer and make him a preacher. I know a Jesus that would take a worship leader and put him in the choir. I know a Jesus that would make a prostitute sing like she's anointed by the... I can't help you. But I know a Jesus that sets the captive string. And I got saved that day, and I sat down on the front row of the stage. I'll never forget it. I had a cookie in my back pocket, a slab. Sat down. Quickly, the devil was on me. My phone rang. A dude said, Dirty, I need a hundred. Got a hundred. I need a hundred. I need a hundred. I said, I got you, bro. I reached in my back pocket and I had crushed my cookie. I said, Ugh! I got to re cook it. And I'm going to lose. And I told the neighbor, Take me back to my truck. Okay. Just keep your mouth shut and take me back to my truck. Whatever you need. I get in my truck, I go into my bag, listen to me. I pull out four tenths, almost a half a gram of pure ice. Not none of this MSN. No, when we used to get it straight off the border. I took it, I ate it. I should have been rocking for four or five days. I get in my truck, I go by the graveyard towards my Uncle Jimmy's house, and I pull over on the side of the road and I fall asleep. Woke up the next morning, sheriff's department all around me. I had, I'm, I, I had already called one dope charge. I'm out on bond because I was caught in Moreland Park, and I tried to 
I put a bunch of dope in a two liter bottle and I threw it underneath the girl that was in the car and acted like I was the crackhead and she was the dope dealer. It was going to work until one of the narcotics detectives looked at the deputy and said, you know who that is? My phone's just ringing on the trunk. I'm like, man, I said, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to throw it. Just going off. I'm like, yeah, I'm jammed up now. The sheriff's apartment surrounded me. And I woke up. And they got a way to come in, trust me. I wasn't letting them in, but they came in. Found more dope on me. Said, you won't beat this one. Put the truck on the record, towed it away, took everything. I get down to the jail, and a public defender comes to me. Because, listen, when the money's gone, the girls are gone, everything, everybody, listen, they're only there for the money. Trust me. I knew it, but everybody loves me for the money, right? The girls, you're not Brad Pitt. They're there because of the money. All right? I didn't care. I knew it. But I get down to the jail. A public defender comes to me, and he says, I, I told the public defender, I said, let run my charges concurrent. I just did a year. Run concurrent. Give me 18 months. I'll sign. I'll do my game time. I'll be out 14 months. Push up. I can do that stand on my head. Run concurrent. Tell him I'll sign. Run concurrent. He said, nah. He said, your mama won't live that long. I'm like, what do you care about my mama? Here's five years probation. I'm like, I'm not taking paper. Heck no, y'all set me up, man. I'm not, I, I better go to prison. I'm not taking paper. He said, Derek, your mom won't live that long. Take the probation. I said, how do you know about my mama? He wouldn't answer me. I said, I'll take as long as Rick Costanza ain't my parole officer, my probation officer. So I signed it. I get out. And Doug Strickland walks by me. No, not Doug Strickland. Another, another uh, sea breeze or whatever. He says, hey, you got to report to probation. Like, oh, yeah, who's my probation officer? He's like, Costanza. Like, God, I'm going to prison, man. That joker was the, the, the hatcher, bro. He, he just had a bad day lock everybody up. He's actually a board member of mine now. God got a hold of him, thank God. <laughs> So I know, I know I gotta, I'm trying to be fast here. So I reported on probation. I told him, God's changed my life. He told me exact words. He says, if you so much as pass gas, not so much those words, and I smell it, five years in prison. He says, and I, I'm looking forward to that. I'm like, do I just, just want to make sure my mama, I got out and three days later my mama died. Oh, I'll never forget that day. I made a promise to her, though, that I would change my life. And I got on probation. I moved into the church at Discovery Church. Well, I was with uh, my cousin Jesse Mills in a camper. That probably wasn't the best idea. Uh, but then, he, then I was, I shared what happened. Let me share this. I was at the spot on 229. When I went there, the dude owed me some money. I had nowhere to go. I said, I'm staying here. I pulled up into the spot. I said, you owe me money. I'm staying until I get on my feet. My mom died. I didn't have any money for any, no funeral or nothing. And I'll never forget it. I sat there in the room and I said, God, if you're real, my exact words, if you're real, you better figure out a way to pay for my mother's funeral because I'm going to go get an ounce of cocaine fronted and I'm going to... I'm going to get back to doing what I do. No sooner did I stepped outside to put my shoes on, I was headed to, 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 to the people. A black truck pulls in. It was Brian Tillman and Gary Bond pulls up. I thought it was the feds. I'm like, oh, man, they have a charge for me now. They're picking me back up. The two pastors jumped out. They said, Derek, the infamous Derek West. I'm like, who are you? Well, I'm Pastor Brian and Pastor Gary Bond. He said, hey, listen, man. He said, oh, I know you don't know me, and I don't know you. I said, I don't. He said, but I want you to move into my church office. I'm like, I ain't doing that. Move into your church office, no way. Pride, I'm not. When you're the poor kid your whole life, you don't want nobody doing nothing for you. I'm good. 
He said, hey, but listen, man, the other day I was sitting at my desk. You probably don't understand this, but God spoke to me about you. I said, oh, yeah? He said, a year ago I got a free funeral card. And he told me to use that funeral card for your mama's funeral. He said, look, your mama's funeral's paid for. All right. But then I started my rigorous training. I said, I'm called to be a pastor. They said, no, you ain't. We'll see. And I went through hell. Still am. 16 years later, proven to, to everybody that I'm actually saved. I, no, seriously, I went through hell. One test after the other, after the other, after the other. Is he saved? They put me in these scenarios to see how I would handle things. Listen, you're talking to a guy that's been in the streets his whole life. Do you think I'm that ignorant that I can't see that? Brother, I see it. I've been doing this thing since I was a kid. But I went through the test because the community didn't believe I was saved. I got off probation two years early in the entire narcotics unit. I go to the court, my court case, and the narcotics squad comes in behind me, and I'm with Gary Bunn. I'm like, what, is the, what are they all here for? Judge Holman asked the state's attorney, what do, you, state, what, what do you have to say about Derek West? State's attorney says, Your Honor, a lot of good things happen on the road to Damascus. He said, Derek, you're off probation. I turned around and all the narcotics unit was there. I'm like, I walk out in the courtroom and they're all standing in line. They shook my hand. One of them says, I didn't think you was going to make it. The other one said, the other one asked, where's your brother? I'm like, man, uh-uh. And then they shipped me to New York. They said I wasn't out of that life long enough and I would go back. So I went to New York to Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Lived in the church. The Assemblies of God paid for my whole school. And then I met my wife that God sent me. Which I'm thankful for. You know, I met her and her history. We, got, we felt God call us. We kept ourselves pure until that day. It's the hardest thing I ever did. And we got married. We have three beautiful babies and one on the way. I got my GED and I went to school for three years with the Assemblies of God and then I started planting churches and traveling around as an evangelist. And I lived in New York for 10 years. I never wanted to come back to Florida. There'd be times I missed my home, but I knew that there was nothing good here. When my wife thinks of Florida, she thinks of the villages in Disney World. I think about dope holes and crack houses and, and all the other things that come to my mind. And My wife got cancer. Boy, if I was ever close to leaving, it was at that time. The walking away. When she was dying in the bed, and she can't take pain pills because she's in recovery. So she's having to do all the chemo without pain meds because she's in recovery. And I would listen to her moan when me and my baby sit on the front living room, saying to God, Man, you, I've done everything you've asked me to do. You know, took my mama, but daddy's dead. But you can't take my wife from me. <clears throat> we went through that process. It was a dark time for me personally. Dark. Anyway, God healed my wife. <clears throat> then she told me, she says, hey, God's calling, and calling you back home. Back home where? To Florida. So he ain't calling me back to Florida. <laughs> she says, yes, he is. I said, no, no, he's not, man. He didn't tell me that. I'll never forget what I told her. Pride and arrogance had welled up inside of me. I said, look at them, all we built. We had five campuses. I'm traveling all through the north. I mean, I was a presbyter. I oversaw the, the northern New York of churches. I wasn't even 40 years old yet. And I'll never forget it. I got in the car with my last revival on Interstate 81, Grand Central Square. The Lord, I pulled over to Dunkin' Donuts and God said, Derek, let my church go. They don't belong to you. So I, I said, I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. 
So we're going to plant a church. I don't know what I'm going to do, God. I don't. It's easier when it's just you by yourself, but I got three kids and a wife. And I went to the, the board. I, said, I looked at my associate pastor. I said, guess what? All this is yours. He's like, he was sad and happy at the same time. Bless his heart. He, he wanted to be sad, but he was pumped up, boy. I said, look, God told me to give it to you guys. They're still running well. We packed up our stuff, sold our house. I had a log cabin with 10 acres with a little creek that ran behind me. The foothills of the Andorondacks, man, it was beautiful. I loved it. We packed, we sold everything, got in the Penske truck. Now listen, 10 years to the day, Rick Costanza walks into the district office of the Assemblies of God, looks at them, and he says to them, we're bringing him home now. Release him. And they didn't ask no questions. You ain't going to ask who this guy is? Release him, bring him home. Ten years to the day, I'm in a Penske truck headed home with a vision to plant a church. I didn't know how I was going to plant a church. I didn't know what I was going to do. We came here. I didn't have any money. Just bought a house. I planned on going to work. I'm not afraid to work. And uh, I passed Dale Clayton. Dale Clayton was on his way out of the church. He felt like closing the church down. He said, man, I'll team up with you. And we took over Coleman. Didn't have any money. God moved on. I'll share that story. I'm sitting at Coleman on the front bench. There was no ACs didn't work. It was smelling. I'm like, man, God, I need some money. And a phone call came. It was a man, Brian, and his family said, hey, I got a donation I want to give you at the church. And he came to the church, and he gave me a check. I wanted to look at it, but I didn't want to be rude, so I put it in my pocket and said, won't you look at it? I opened it up. It was $103,000. Their, their daddy passed away, and they sold the church, and they gave me another church, that money. And the church started growing. We had launch services. I had, I had my first service in the living room. There was 15 of us. Oh. Uh, most of them were my cousins, actually. Most of them were family. Uh, most of them. Dale was there. Um, but they, they believed in it, and they are going to get behind it. And they had to make some moves, too, because they, they had to believe that God's using me. And the rest is his history. You know, I, I've been proving that I'm saved for a long time. You know, we have a lot of battles. I have a lot of battles pastoring in my hometown. You know, people look at me with suspicion always. I tell my guys, I said, look, we created this bed. We got to lay in it. Nobody, we're not a product of our environment. We're the product of the decisions that we made. We can't. But we keep pushing. And we started this business. God bless the business. I don't have to eat ramen noodles anymore. I don't worry about cockroaches in my cereal. I got three bathrooms to use the bathroom in. But you know, my family's strung out. My sister's dying. I got a lot of private battles that me and my wife know about that you guys I don't share. Because of, because of our history. But I can tell you this. The only reason why I'm here today is because Jesus Christ loved me so much. I didn't I have a GED, but Jesus Christ picked somebody that the world said was a waste. He picked somebody that the world said would never amount to anything. And he uses us to shame the wise. He anointed me with his spirit. He put a word in my heart and he pleaded the blood on the cross that I could be set free. And the only reason why I'm here today is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. How he came and died and bled and rose on the third day. And I can tell you, I was once lost, but now I am found. But it's all because of what Jesus Christ did. Worship team. Do I have
have issues, man. I don't like people around me. I don't like people behind me. I got issues. I'll share a story with you that something happened on this trip while the worship team's coming. Another scar. Brett and Jeremiah, I take Jeremiah with me on a crusade. He's a young, he's younger than me. His first crusade, a young Christian. We fly into man, we fly into JFK. I get to, to the Bronx. The church sends a chauffeur, a chaperone to take us around. I board the Metro North. I get on a subway. There's five people on the subway. It's a quiet Wednesday night. We're talking about God. I'm going to show you how real the battle is. A young kid, probably 20 years old, a good-looking kid, gets up and sits on a bench for me to Joey. He looks at me and he smiles at me. I said, man, that's the most evilest. I said, that's an evil feeling. It's an evil smile. He pulls his cell phone out. He turns on his radio, sits it there, and it's playing satanic music. You can hear them worshiping Satan through the chorus. Fire came from me like I wanted to, to check them. But I had Jeremiah with me. I didn't want him to see that kind of ministry yet. <laughs> I want, but I felt he was disrespecting me. The first subway comes through. He stands up and he sits back down. Doing 60 miles an hour. I'm thinking, man, that thing's flying. The second train's coming. He looks at us. Sets his phone down. And right when the train gets here, he jumps in front of him. The train cuts him in half. Me and Jeremiah and Brett stand there for 15 minutes and look at this body of this young man that Satan took before the cops came. His shirt was picked up and he had a pentagram on his stomach. And I kept saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? What are you trying to show me for these two guys who are from the hills of Missouri and from North Florida? What are you trying to show these two men? They're not used to this lifestyle. I've seen death, but I've never seen it as bad as this. And the Lord spoke to me that day. He said, Derek, I want you to know where you're going. And how real the battle is. You see, Jeremiah cried out to God. Let me share this with you. Jeremiah cried out to God. He was preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. And he cried out to God. He said, God, nobody's getting saved. I'm preaching to my family. They don't hear me. And he kept complaining because no one's getting saved. And he get weary. And he was roaring out. And, and he cried out to God. And God spoke to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, he said, if the foot soldiers weary you, how will you ever contend with the Calvary? And if, if you can't preach the gospel in your hometown, how will you ever preach the gospel on the floodplain of the Jordan? That kid was killed worshiping an evil deity. And the Lord allowed me to see that to show us that how real this battle is. We are seeing young people overdosing from addiction. We are seeing children being sold into slick slavery. We are seeing high school students falling away from God. And the church is more concerned about landscaping than they are renting souls for Jesus. We're too busy fighting each other than ever to reach the gospel, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we're built different. We can't, we don't have nothing to lose. If I don't serve God, I rob and steal. If I don't serve God, I die. You know, there's no turning back for Derek West. I don't came too far. There's no, I don't have a backup. I am the backup. There's no turning back. My Jesus saved me. 
And if you want to experience the same Jesus that I experienced, I want to give an altar call. And don't be worried about what people think. You don't care what they think when you're drunk in the club. We deal with so much on a daily, daily, daily dose. And daily, my wife and I, but so don't you. We, I'm not going to procry the victim. Building a church, we put everything we got, everything we got into this. Everything. We put our money where our mouth is. We put our time. Everything we got goes into building God's kingdom. So I have a different view of things than most. Because I'm not playing. We put everything. Our family sacrifices everything we got into this. Everything we got. So forgive me if your pastor looks at things differently. Because I'm putting everything I got into it. If you can't understand it, I'm sorry. But I didn't come all the way from New York to play church. I came here to build God's kingdom. And if you're not on board, I'm sorry. But I've got somewhere to go. I've got somewhere to go. I'm going somewhere. You want to accept Jesus Christ today and you're sitting there. Church, please stand. Raise your hand. Come on down. I see you.